Hi, everybody, and welcome. It's really great to see everybody here. I'm really excited about this event. I'm just going to keep you from it for like two minutes, though, to, to give it a little bit of an intro. Um, so I'm Lee Spector. I'm a professor of computer science. Um, and before I introduce our speaker, many of you probably already know anyway, I'm going to say a few words about the Artificial Intelligence and the Liberal Arts Initiative, which is uh, what's bringing me this talk. So the, the premise of the AI and Liberal Arts Initiative is that students and faculty in all disciplines uh, should have ways to engage with the itch, issues emerging from artificial intelligence, and particularly recent uh, fairly dramatic um, uh, developments in not both within artificial intelligence and in the intersection between artificial intelligence and society and, and academic disciplines, I, I would argue, pretty much across the board. Um, so uh, what do I mean by that? It's not only that uh, people across the discipline should have the opportunity to use AI technologies, which is a piece of it, but also to uh, engage intellectually with how these new technologies might change their thinking about what they do um, or influence the future of uh, their own demands of study. Um, and what roles AI technology should play in the future of human society. Now, one of the things that we're doing in ILA, as we call it, is to have speakers. And they're great speakers that we're, we're uh, bringing to have. Uh, interesting new perspectives, different perspectives on um, on AI, but we are also working to um, provide accessible AI software and hardware um, that uh, that people in different disciplines can use to provide mentors, and we're beginning a mentorship program uh, uh, to help people, students and faculty across disciplines understand and make use of AI technology. We have an online forum for discussions about these intersections, um, and we're developing some other initiatives as well. Uh, you can find out more uh, by going to liberal-arts.ai. That's our main website. And um, uh, among the things there is our forum, a link to our forum, which is a separate website, but it's sort of integrated with it, where there will be a discussion thread for this event and for all of our other events. And you can also just go there and start a discussion thread about anything you're interested in uh, about AI. And connections between AI and other disciplines are especially welcome. So I want to really strongly encourage you to check out liberal-arts.ai and go visit the forum, check out the stuff that's happening there, and contribute. Um, we have a bunch of other events planned this um, semester including uh, March 22nd, that's a Wednesday, the first Wednesday after spring break. Laura Sizer, philosopher, is going to be giving a talk called Mind the Bot? Question mark. How close are chatbots to having minds like ours? Uh, later on in the semester, we're going to have Brendan O'Connor, a uh, computer scientist, uh, giving a talk called Artificial Intelligence is Social Science, Natural Language Processing from and for Social Analysis. Uh, later in the semester, we'll also be having a panel discussion on AI and war um, and a dance performance built on dance practice that uses machine learning. So those are among the events coming just this semester, so stay tuned for that. Now to today's speaker. Uh, Chris Grove is an associate professor of English and chair of the English department and the incoming director of the Center for Human Inquiry. A little bit busy, maybe. Um, all of that is here at Amherst. His BA, Master's, and Doctorate all, are all from Yale. He specializes in 20th century entangle, in the 20th century entanglement of literature, performance, media, and technology in American culture. His talk today is on making technology talk, conversation, and slash as artificial. Please join me in welcoming Professor Christopher. I'm glad to see the Bobo was such a big draw. Um, <laughs> now, now, now you have to sit there and talk. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what this talk is. Um, well, actually, first I want to say thank, thanks to Lee for inviting me to, to give this talk. And 
and for creating the community that gives an occasion for this talk. I think it's such an important set of questions that that, that um, group is addressing, and I hope to be part of these conversations going forward. So, um, what this is. This is a thing that, at some point or other, has been a 20,000 word chapter that has become a 12,000 word article that's um, coming out soon in an open access journal called Post 45. Um, and uh, if you go to that URL, there's a, a draft of that, the full draft of the article. Um, I just asked you not to circulate it beyond this community. Um, it will be out there soon. Um, also at that link are uh, three handouts uh, that are also available in hard copy up here. Um, and yeah, I will sometimes be reading a few passages from the article draft that's up there, but mostly not. Um, mostly we'll just be playing around with uh, some of the text on those handouts. Um, and yeah, I'll start though with the, the intro to that um, article because I think it, it sort of sets out the terrain that I'm exploring and sets some of the stakes for it. So I want you um, to imagine a world where uh, your virtual personal assistant, Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, is more human than you know. Imagine that your queries and commands are sent not to servers where they're processed by algorithms, but to call centers where they are fielded by wage workers. Um, you might ask your device a question, for example, what bird is this? And you're connected to a specialist in bird calls. Um, she listens in, asks some follow-up questions, then shares her conclusions, but you never hear her voice, not exactly, because somewhere between uh, her lips and your device, her voice somehow turns robotic. You may never even know a human being was involved. Um, so this scenario is the premise of Sandra, an audio drama uh, released in 2018 by the podcast network Gimlet. I'm just playing a little clip of it. You can hear the call center worker's voice turning into the voice of something like Alexa. Oops. I can help. Sandra, what bird is this? I can help with that, but I need some more information. Can you just send it her to me? Okay, so. As you can see, some big Hollywood names were involved in this. Um, Kristen Mick, Alia Shawkat, Ethan Hawke had a, a supporting role in it. Um, big deal. But it was kind of a flop. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you never heard of it. Um, and you know, critics were, were critical of the plot, which admittedly went haywire, but they all loved its parts. Um, they thought this idea of a kind of Wizard of Oz Alexa, um, that is like a supposed AI that's just a front for human workers, was a kind of edgy thought experiment, a mind-bending twist on reality as we know it, um, that unlike its real-world counterparts, as one critic explained, uh, Sandra is not AI-driven at all. Um, imagine that. But um, you don't actually have to imagine it because you're living it. Um, Sandra's real-world counterparts aren't AI-driven either, at least not in the way that that critic seems to me. Um, so in real life, Amazon Echo. In real life, uh, as in the fictional world of Sandra, intelligent software parses your speech, uh, interprets your words, and this process is indeed AI-driven. It's called Natural Language Understanding, or uh, NLU. Um, and then in Sandra, as in reality, the software makes a decision about how to respond. In Sandra, it forwards your words to a cubicle in this call center, and in reality, it calls up the right script for your device to perform. Um, a script that, in almost every instance, has been written word for word by human beings. Okay. So, um, vanishingly few of the words spoken to date by Siri, Alexa, and their ilk have been the products of natural language generation, or NLG. Um, and that may be about to change soon. And so part of what this talk is about is trying to think about a, um, a sort of history and a context in which we can think about what's coming next as these companies try to involve more generative AI um, and more natural language generation into their systems. Um, one of the reasons they haven't used it so far, I mean, besides the fact that a lot of the really public stuff has only 
happened recently in terms of um, sort of public, um, big, big splashy releases of generative AI, um, is the legal conservativeness of these corporations. They really worry that, <laughs> you okay? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, one of, uh, I, I can't tell you which one, but a hiring employee at one of the big five uh, said like, yeah, the, the lawyers tell me that they're worried that uh, we're gonna treat, that, that people will, will approach our virtual assistant as like a CEO level spokesperson for the company. And when you think about what's happened with ChatGPT and with Bing's Sydney of like the sort of unreliability and occasional racism and stuff of these systems, right? There's obvious reason why they wouldn't want to do that. Um, so, uh, while a software agent may supply a variable or two, um, the shape of most sentences to date and each variable's place within that sentence has typically been set by human hands. Um, and uh, since 2018 or so, I've been getting to know those humans. They have job titles like uh, interaction designer, experience writer, personality designer, and um, they work in a, f a field known as voice user interface or voice user experience design. I'm going to say buoy design from now on. Um, and when you throw text-only chatbots into the mix, the, the, the umbrella term is conversation design. So you may hear me use that too. Um, and so some of these people work in-house for companies like Amazon and Google, and others work freelance at specialist design agencies where they build Alexa skills and Google Actions and other kind of voice-based software applications. <laughs> okay, so, um, interestingly, their ranks include not only the usual suspects, project managers, software developers, etc., but also um, a wide range of experts in language and expression, which includes empirical experts like linguists, psychologists, etc., um, but also aesthetic experts like poets, novelists, screenwriters, playwrights, actors, comedians, etc. And it's that, that set of people that I'm particularly interested in as a historian of the arts. Um, so crucially, these are not the low status ghost workers. I borrow that term from an anthropologist, Mary Gray. Um, that is, they're not like the call center operators in Sandra, um, nor are they like the real life workers around the world whose like little micro tasks of moderation and quality control and data tagging and whatnot um, sort of make the algorithms that, we, that shape our online lives tick. They're, they are in fact typically, many of them, high status employees, often salaried full timers who are expected and have been hired to shape software systems at the level of design. Okay, so. Um, I'm situating their existence in sort of three different sort of research topics. One is, um, you know, I came to this topic because I was interested in the history of AI and the history of how AI has been understood as an artistic and not just a technical problem. And especially it's been thought of as a, as a theatrical problem in ways I'll talk about. Um, it was my interest in that that brought me to Palo Alto <laughs> where I suddenly started meeting a lot of these people, especially performers and dramatists who were employed in the design of conversational systems. And I came to Eliza, um, the earliest chatbot from 1965, um, as an example of the history of AI being understood as an artistic and a theatrical project, um, but also as something that was coming up all the time in my conversations with these conversation designers. And I was curious as to why. So it's AI and the liberal arts that gathers us here today. Um, and I feel like the questions that were raised for me by all of this are essentially questions about AI and the liberal arts. They're questions like, how do you combine technical and artistic knowledge? in the design of software, right? Um, how do artists, because I'm looking at artists who enter these corporate spaces, right? How do artists learn to articulate their expertise as knowledge um, that is transferable into those kind of spaces? Um, and then how do technologists make space for arts knowledge to enter those spaces as an equal, as something that's allowed to intersect with technology in transformational ways? Um, 
one question I kept that just kept coming up with these artists is like, how much of what they know as artists about character, dialogue, etc., are they expected or asked to surrender as a condition of their even entering these spaces in the first place? And the answer in a lot of the, in some of those spaces is quite a lot, right? They're sort of um, they're sort of brought in not to uh, in some in some spaces not to affect the design of the product, but to pretty it up after the fact. They're supplying content for a system whose basic parameters have already been designed, or they're supposed to add something delightful for marketing purposes to, again, a system whose parameters have already been defined. Um, OK, so what I heard was these people using Eliza as a tool, and therefore I'm following them and using Eliza as a tool to think through those kinds of quandaries. And my, um, my interest in it, as I said, is as like a, um, a model of how technical and artistic knowledge might come together um, in designing a software system um, that engages in this kind of conversation. So um, Eliza, designed in 1965 by the computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum. Um, it was technologically simple even by the standards of its day. I think that's an important thing to know. We are not talking about sophisticated uh, software. In fact, we, didn't you say that you had like half students code it in like entry level classes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and yet, it startled many of its contemporaries by creating the illusion, however brittle, fleeting, fragile, um, that they were conversing with a person. And when I was speaking with present day conversation designers, they were often echoing a sentiment I heard expressed by um, Kathy Pearl. Um, who works at Google and wrote the book Design, Designing Voice User Interfaces, she wrote, quote, uh, that the field has not evolved very far from Eliza. Um, so in an industry that's pretty prone to hype, this is a startling admission. And I, I think it's not true, actually. Um, that is, that certainly the NLU algorithms behind Google Assistant are light years beyond Eliza's sort of jury-rigged mixture of keyword recognition and stalling tactics. And um, even in the absence of trustworthy NLG, conversation designers today have like way more tools at their disposal than, than Weizenbaum had. Um, but the more I, I heard this sentiment echoed, and the more I spoke with conversation designers, I kind of learned to see Eliza through their eyes. And, and um, I realized they were right in one significant way, that today's conversational software has scarcely evolved in its um, in its deployment of techniques and ideas from the arts. Uh, or rather, after decades of excluding arts knowledge from the practice of creating conversational interfaces, the tech industry is only now beginning to include it again and not managing to combine them nearly as deftly as Weizenbaum had done back in 1965. Um, so Weizenbaum uh, did not only draw on programming skills to create this chatbot. Um, he uh, he also ventured into what he called the domain of the playwright, um, which is to say he was applying uh, particular lessons from the theater to Eliza. And, um, and so by hiring artists, I see companies starting to re-enter that turf of combining the realm of the programmer with the domain of the playwright again. Um, and so learning to see Eliza through the eyes of conversation designers not only teaches us something about them and their work, it also offers us um, a fresh perspective on a historically important bit of software. So over the last 60 years, Eliza has been analyzed to death and has almost always been studied in one way, that is as a, as a kind of philosophical toy um, that teaches us something about technology and, like technology and humanity and gender and language, etc. And scholars have told us that uh, you know, this chatbot reveals the perils of being deceived by technology, or that it, um, or that it uh, shows us the pleasures of suspending our disbelief in the face of technology. Um, they've told us that it exposes our habit of projecting humanity and intelligence onto technology, something that people have called since then the Eliza effect. Um, and um, they've also shown us how 
these kinds of acts of projection can unsettle received notions of humanity and intelligence of what they are in the first place. Um, and when they interpret Eliza this way, as a philosophical toy, um, scholars uh, are kind of following Weizenbaum's own lead because later in life, he spun the tale that he had only made this chatbot to prove a point. And that point is a satirical point, that people are too gullible and that they're going to be tricked into believing in the humanity and the intelligence of machines. And he's worried about the dangers of that, right? Um, and uh, I seem to be the only scholar who's noticed this. That was only after years spent trying to turn Eliza into something very closely resembling Alexa, Google Assistant, and Siri, right? So um, he was trying to scale it up, um, get it to be able to do more things, handle a, a wider variety of scripts and tasks and conversational subjects. And um, so I'm asking us to go back and, and sort of reread this chatbot uh, in light of those discarded ambitions that it, uh, and I, I think when you do that, we see him as a fellow conversation designer with the folks who are working in that field today. Um, OK, so let me just quickly explain what the handouts are that you have in front of you. Um, we've got two samples of Google Assistant's house style. Um, that's the one that has more like a image on one side. Uh, the Google I.O. 18 dialogue. Uh, yes, and if you want digital copies of the handouts, they're at that URL there. Yeah, Jeff. Sorry, I just want to say that I have more chairs there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You reach just come over here. There are more chairs. More chairs. Go sit. Um, there are a few people. <laughs> Two moments. <laughs> All right, so there's, there's Google Assistant stuff. Um, a kind of two different approaches, as we'll talk about, that Google uses. Uh, there's um, an early transcript of Eliza, the chatbot. That's the one that's in like all caps followed by all lowercase. Um, and front and back, this weird hard to read one is the some of the code behind that transcript. Um, and then I don't think I'll get to it, but on the back of the um, the Eliza transcript is this uh, absurdist dialogue with Siri, which was um, published by a former creative director of Siri in Paris Review pretty much as soon as she left Apple. <laughs> um, so um, from here on out, it's, it's kind of choose your own adventure, um, but uh, I just wanted to make a sort of Uh, as a series of points, and then we can open it up for questions. Uh, I should also say, just background, in case it helps guide your questions, the kind of research that lies behind this project, um, there's ethnographic research that I did. I have dozens of interviews and site visits in the Silicon Valley. Um, there's like, obviously, I've already been talking about kind of historical and theoretical background of um, like research on corporate culture, tech culture, etc. And then there's other primary sources that I've already been referring to that are like all of the materials created by conversation designers and the companies they work for to describe this work. So that's kind of what I'm drawing on here. Um, and uh, let's turn to the Google stuff first. So um, flip to the side that says from Mishra Sachet uh, how we designed it. Okay. Um, Okay, so I am offering this as an example of the disappointing house style of Google. And let me tell you a little bit about where that style comes from. So, um, uh, the woman you see on that side of the slide, her name is Catherine Pearl, author of this book I've already referred to. Um, for many years, she was the uh, Director of Conversation Design Outreach. That is, she was the public face of that, of Google Assistant, um, and was responsible for teaching other people how to build actions on that platform. 
And the thing you need to know about Kathy Curl is that she comes from a background in like telephone systems design and uh, from cognitive science. And so she is thinking often in terms of uh, lightening the user's cognitive load, of uh, getting like clear and fail-proof conversational systems um, that will, as you see it doing here, sort of prompt the user to shout the right command on cue. Right? And everything about this style of conversation design is, is shaped around doing that. So uh, you'll see they've kind of like broken it down, uh, each of these spoken prompts, um, into these categories like setting the expectations, framing the question, narrow focus question, which is designed to get you to say, yeah, all right? And then again, setting expectations, giving three suggestions of what you can do, and then asking for an answer. And then you say one of the things, right? Um, so it's really directive. It's really, um, it's got the same rhythm over and over again. And this is such a familiar way in which we interact with telephone systems and AI and conversational AI systems that like, um, I mean, oh, this, there's this parody of it in um, the movie Her, directed by Spike Jonze, it's about a, um, a more intelligent system than that, where the, essentially the joke is that uh, this character here is carrying over bad habits from the kind of systems we use. So, oh, sorry. Hey, you just got an email from Mark Lumen. What are you talking about? Oh, the email. Okay, I will read email for Theodore Hawkins. <laughs> so he says, read email, right? He's like in the dehumanizing, shouting the command way. And she puts on the AI system, Scarlett Johansson, puts on this robot voice to sort of make fun of him for doing that. But this is, this is the world we live in, right? Does, controlled by this style of conversation design, that is what we are prompted to do. And this is a kind of decision tree where there have to be limited options so that it can send you onto these branching paths and, um, and so that everything can be, um, you know, like perfectly controlled and predictable, yeah? Um, so that's the main style. Okay, second style you see on the back. This is the one that Kathy Pearl says you want to use when you want the system to be, and I quote, as flexible as possible. Uh, and it's, it's called, she calls it dialogue management. Basically, instead of a decision tree, what you have is a spreadsheet behind the scenes and then a variable series of tactics for getting people to say the things that will fill the cells in that spreadsheet. Yeah? So here we have two different examples of how that could play out with a pizza ordering app. These are examples from her book. And you see it is more flexible, right? It can like, um, like maybe uh, take the second one. Um, when the user responds to the elaborately structured prompt at the beginning with, uh, yeah, I want to order some pizzas, like that would totally mess up the decision tree version, right? But it, it can work in the dialogue management system because when the user doesn't take the lead, the system can do it, right? It can say, okay, great, so how many would you like? It focuses on one cell in the spreadsheet. Once we have the number of pizzas, then it creates all the cells for the toppings and the crust and whatever, right behind the scenes. Um, this at Google is what counts as flexible, as flexible as possible, right? It's like data entry work by voice. And you understand why, in terms of their business model, why that would be, why these would be the two um, modes that they would go in, right? So um, one thing that Google does a lot of is give people structured access to large amounts of information. That's the decision tree, right? Another thing they like to do is enable financial transactions through their platforms. And uh, like this sort of data entry by voice, very good for that. Um, but uh, I think it's very disappointing in lots of ways. And, um, and it makes me wonder what role an artist could have ever had in this. And so I, I was interviewing uh, Kathy Pearl and I asked her about artists. And at, at the start, she seemed kind of confused and surprised, like, oh, we have artists on our staff, right? And, uh, and, uh, and then when she answered, um, she was like, oh, yeah, well, like, 
They have a certain facility with words, they bring a different perspective, they're creative, they have good instincts, uh, they tolerate ambiguity. That's the one in the tech industry. They tolerate ambiguity well. Um, and yet, like, it's very clear that in my, the rest of the conversation with her that um, she mainly experiences artists as obstacles. Um, that is, that they're noticeable when they dissent from the user tested, A-B testing, <laughs> user experience design research protocols that lie behind something like this. And so there are two cultures of conversation design for her. One pursues aesthetic quality. It's annoying when it conflicts with the one that pursues quantifiable effects. Um, and, um, and I think that, that, like all two culture debates, that sort of overstates the difference between the two. Um, and I think, you know, the, the clearest proof I found of that is that, that in fact, Capital does have like aesthetic preferences and has an aesthetic vision for Google Assistant. It just confusingly is not um, supplied by any of the artists on the payroll. Um, so she, like many people in the industry, refers constantly to the Star Trek computer as like the model of how I want these things to be, right? Um, and yeah, so she says in her book that like when somebody made a Bluetooth-enabled com badge that could interface with Google Assistant, like that was everything coming full circle for her. Okay, so um, I would argue that this is a false inclusion of the arts. Um, that is like employing artists and then denigrating or ignoring their knowledge, involving qualitative experts, refusing qualitative standards, right? And, um, and doing all of this while kind of claiming a mantle of creativity that once belonged to the arts. And I, I want to talk about this because I think it's really important to understanding the tech industry today. The tech industry loves creativity. What they mean by that is somewhat less clear. And I wanted to just sort of raise that for you because in a space like this, I think we need to be thinking about what exactly is the intersection between the arts and technology and what does creativity have to do with it. So, uh, on one side, you see the t cover of a forthcoming book called The Creativity Complex, Art, Tech, and the Seduction of an Idea by Shannon Steen, who's a theater professor at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, on the right, uh, this was prettier than anything I could actually find that was more relevant to precisely what I want to say, uh, is the work of Fred Turner, um, who's a uh, communication scholar at Stanford, uh, who's written a lot about the history and the present sort of corporate environment of um, Silicon Valley. And uh, you know, Shannon Steen, what she calls the creativity complex, is a kind of interlocking system of ideologies and institutions that has embraced what they call creativity as a kind of workforce competency, uh, while also reducing the arts, once synonymous with creativity, uh, to, quote, the symbolic status of inspiring handmaiden for technology. Um, and what she means by that, I think Fred Turner explains really nicely in an essay he wrote called The Arts at Facebook, which is a study of the artist in residence program at Facebook. Um, so he says, um, he shows how kind of like artists often function more as mascots for a certain mindset or mood in approaching technology, um, and a mindset or mood that could belong in equal measure to software engineers, project managers, etc. So quote, by inviting artists to paint directly on Facebook's walls, even as programmers code all around them, the Artists in Residence program asks engineers to imagine themselves as artists, uh, likewise making beauty by turning the world into patterned code. Um, so in other words, the Artists in Residence has primarily been hired to convince engineers and MBAs that they belong in the company of artists. Um, they are, in some sense, artists themselves. Um, and what interested me about all these artists being hired as conversation designers is that based on a slightly different vision of the relationship of creativity and technology. That is, you know, you look at some of these job ads and they're calling for substantial experience in creative writing, in performance, screenwriting, et cetera. And it's clearly based on the theory that there's an expert knowledge base that, that these artists have that's useful. And, um, and so I kind of want to like, use the existence of these people to push beyond what seems like a kind of tired and frankly insulting ideology of what role the arts have to play in a, in a space like Silicon Valley. 
Um, so like, for instance, a 2020 ad from Apple asked for, quote, demonstrated experience in writing character-driven dialogue um, to give a distinct recognizable character to Siri. Um, similar ad from Amazon asked that as a basic qualification, applicants demonstrate seven plus years for creative writing experience, including character development. Um, anyway, so, uh, these are the people that I'm talking to, are the people who are hired under that different theory of um, the role of the arts. And they kept pointing me back to Eliza as something that was a kind of um, currency they could use in uh, giving a value to and articulating what it is they bring into those type of corporate spaces. Um, and so I want to turn now to Eliza. Um, and if you um, look first at the transcript, the one that's like alternate all caps and lowercase. Um, OK, so the way that Eliza works is by recognizing keywords, basically. Um, and uh, part of why someone like Kathy Pearl likes decision trees and dialogue management systems is um, that she looks down on these one-off responses to keywords or intents in a system. And she prefers multi-turn conversational flows. They seem more complex to her. But I would argue that what Wise Monk did was take a bunch of one-off responses and build them into a system that I, as a theater person, recognize as having a shape that's more complex than uh, just a bunch of one-off responses. And I um, want you to look at this transcript and uh, follow along with me so I can show you what is happening here. So the keywords in the small print, uh, the lowercase print, that Eliza is picking up on are alike, always, my, depressed, unhappy, I need, etc. Um, they are not what might stand out to you as the most important thing in each of these sentences. Um, and yet, um, using uh, those keywords, I would argue that Wise Mom has created a really compelling experience. And I want to explain to you a little bit about why. So um, um, sorry. OK, so here, uh, yeah. Here's what one of those keywords looks like in the, the script, the code behind the transcript that you're looking at. Um, so it has a couple basic elements. There are transformations. It might take what you have said and substitute some words. So this is turning I into you. So you say, I want boba. And it says, you want boba, right? Um, it then has a, a sort of keyword or key phrase recognition. So this is zeros stand for a string of any length. So this is any number of words. You want or need any number of words. Um, and then in this case, what he's doing is he's picking the fourth string, so this one, and plugging it in wherever you see four in these rules. Right? So uh, why do you want boba? Right? What if you never got boba? What would getting boba mean to you? Right? That's how it works. Um, and you add, there probably the script is only about 50 of these keywords. right? Um, I think it's pretty impressive that it can create what is here a pretty elaborate and accurate representation of what non-directive psychotherapy looks like. Because that's the situation that he chose. Here, right? um, so he chose that scenario, I think, for a telling reason. This is from his original article on Eliza. He says, the psychiatric interview is one of the few examples of dyadic natural language communication in which one of the participating pair is free to assume the pose of knowing almost nothing of the real world. <laughs> says, if, for example, one were to tell a psychiatrist, I went for a long boat ride, and, responded, and he responded, tell me about boats. One would not assume that he knew nothing about boats, but that he had some purpose instead of directing this up to the conversation. <laughs> right? um, so this is here, for me, is where the creativity begins. He's taking the limitations of the existing system and finding a dramatic scenario that matches with them. Right? 
um, and that is capable of producing an effect that is like more than the sum of those parts. Right? So um, men are all, all alike. In what way? Uh, that's an appropriate response. Um, and it's one that throws it back on you, right? Um, well, they're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Right? Um, well, my boyfriend made my, me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here, right? It's just doing all this really simple stuff. But in the process, it is um, developing a sense of drama and of character. Um, and it's sort of using the, the flaws and limitations of the system to help it create a sense of the character. So the fact that the system knows nothing disappears and becomes instead proof of the withholding stance of the psychiatrist who's very knowing and wants you to say something very particular, right? Um, and I want to point out one rule in particular that really seems to have been the one that everybody got excited about when they started playing around with Eliza. It's the one pegged to the keyword my, in, well, my boyfriend may be coming. Right? When my is the highest ranked keyword, he has instructed the program to take whatever they meant, whatever they said, do any transformations it needs to do, and just spit that out. So for my boyfriend made you come here turns into your boyfriend made, me, made you come here. Right? Then he stores it in memory and has constructed the system so that this thing that is um, in complicated ways, like I want to explain now, like likely to happen early in a conversation, will be stored in memory and brought back as late in the conversation as possible. Right? And so it's brought back precisely when the system fails, when there is no keyword that it can recognize. So you'll see at the end here, the uh, user just says bullies. Well, he doesn't have an entry for bullies. So that's its cue to bring this back. Does that have anything to do with the fact that your boyfriend made you come here? And here we have like the climax of therapy, right? The aha moment. And, uh, and yet it's precisely the moment of failure for the system, right? Um, and so that to me is one way in which like Wise Mom, who was a real connoisseur of the theater, loved the theater, talked about doing this work in the domain of the playwright, is understanding how all of these little rules can add up to create a complex system that gives you this satisfying experience. And it's not going to give you the same conversation every time, but it's been shaped in ways I'd be happy to describe more in Q&A to make sure that something like this shape of conversation appears every time, right? It's like a fuzzy map of conversational possibilities. Um, and um, I'll stop here for now. I don't want to say about this, but like that, I'll just say that um, this may seem like a, a dodge. Like this is like glib fakery. But I think these kinds of skills, dealing with the creation of like fuzzy maps of conversational possibilities, is how people are going to be interacting with generative AI systems, um, which you can't do the Kathy, Kathy Pearl thing to, right? Like, you can't shoehorn it into decision trees and pizza apps where everything is determined in advance and you can control what's happening and you can make sure the user says the right thing, right? Um, but instead, it's going to take this softer skills, this real creativity, to provide structures that will make intelligible, useful, and compelling shapes appear from what might otherwise be like a mess of indeterminacy. So I, I'll stop there. I didn't cover nearly what I hoped I would, but, but it's 5.15. So uh, I'll open it up for any questions people have. Or just have responses. Let me just put a footnote. Yeah. Uh, Brian asked me, wait, is this Lisp? And it is. So this stuff was written in Lisp. So those of you who are learning closure from me, that's all a Lisp. And we can easily get you a, a closure a version of the lives of the playoff. Uh, the other thing I want to say is all of you probably have a Liza on your computers and don't know. Uh, yeah. You go into your terminal application and fire up the Emacs text editor, which is self-programmable in this. Um, people would put up that Emacs editor and say, why not try Liza? So Liza in there, you do escape X doctor and you're in Liza.
Cool. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Question. Any of that, or I mean, I showed you all the stuff that I did to research this. If any of it, if you just want to know more about it, um, happy to expand. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I did want to just start with the last uh, example that you were sharing about the lights. Firstly, thank you so much. This is very, very enlightening. Uh, part of it from an artist's perspective. Um, yes, of course, having, I mean, the biggest flaw is systems cannot anticipate all scenarios, like the infinite scenarios that humans can very quickly do and apply the possibilities. So that, that is becoming very clear. But I was thinking about the other element of what Eliza was trying to do mm -hmm. was, for example, when if it had started with, you know, I went on a boat somewhere, yeah. a human conversation would be, oh, I too I went on a boat yesterday. Mm. And it would take the attention away from that person. Whereas right. even though this is a machine, mm -hmm. you know, the, I, I know it led to delusional thinking and all that, but is it helping? I think it led to less than Weizenbaum. It was useful to him to, given his like critique of computing, to Yeah, to yeah that's what that he was happened. amazed the most, no? Like this yeah. lady said, can you leave the room? She actually told him to leave the room not be there yeah. when his assistant was with the system. Yeah. But the fact that it, it is putting her at the center and yeah. asking questions of Socratic techniques yeah. of so many types that are possible, mm -hmm. uh, even though it, it may not be you know, larger in where it can go, is it helping in that situation? Sorry, is it helping? Is it situation? helping that person in that situation? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And so um, there are programs, interesting programs like Eliza out there today. Like there was this um, app that won like an award in 2018 from Amazon um, that was uh, it's called Kids Court. It's the help kids who are fighting about things sort out their differences. And what I. <laughs> What basically, it works by not understanding anything the kids are saying, but just walking them through the procedure of like lodging a complaint and like coming up with evidence. And do they have witnesses? And how are they going to come to a resolution? And then it finishes, right? And it, I think it's sort of like what you're describing, Eliza. It just throws everything back on them. But it's not just, um, it's not just a silly trick. It's actually walking them through a procedure that should lead to something like calm reflection on what happened. And the search for like resolution or amends. Yeah. And so, Sorry. Oh, also, like just a person who is in pain is making is feeling that they are being heard. Yeah. You know, that's the most important thing at that time. Yeah. It's, that was fascinating. I'm not proud of Yeah. Cool. Uh, there's another question Yeah. First of all, I think that the dodge when you as an air routine is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> and it reminds me of video games doing that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a video game will be like, okay, if you haven't done anything in five minutes, something bad has happened. So I'm going to, if you go outside the level, something bad has happened, so I'm just gonna kill you and restart it. Right. But there's another time when like, if you go into a weird place, you might, for example, I remember there's one video game where the game crashed as soon as you exited the game. So they changed the crash message from the game crashed to thank you for playing. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, the idea that you can get, this really reminds me of tabletop RPGs. Yes. And where you've got people designing the system specifically to give you a feeling of the character, to give you the feeling of, we're going to design interactions so that you feel like you're three hamsters in a robot suit, and yeah. we're going to design the way you interact with the world to be roll this die and then do this. Right. And the human does all the work of interpreting it, but it still gives you that feeling. I'm really surprised that more AI research doesn't involve like thinking about tabletop RPGs instead of saying, we're going to design it in this way, this computer thing, yeah. and the artists are just there as an extra to make the lines that we've already drawn yeah. more wavy and beautiful. Totally, totally. And 
like, but what that requires is that, again, like, you are not asking artists to give up everything that they know about art as a condition of entering the space. And you're not inviting them in late after everything has already been determined. Um, there's a, a woman named Rebecca Evanhoe who co-wrote a book with another conversation designer, Diana Deedle, called uh, Conversation with Things, uh, which is interesting. And um, in there, they talk about how like they're often called in to build on top of what they call assumption-laden code. And they are often in the position, uh, so Re Rebecca's a fiction writer, Diana's a playwright, um, of like having to explain to people that dramatic character works on the level that has already been decided. That is, that like the kinds of behaviors that um, that inspire the content of the speech might be encoded in a rule set that they're not being given access to. You know what I mean? If you've got a video game where all you can do is write dialogue for when enemies are being hit by a sword, exactly. you're not going to be able to get a lot of good philosophy in there because it's all going to be variations of Al. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and it might be a system where, um, you know, like, the, you can only respond to stimuli of a certain kind in the first place, or you can only you can only be responsive if you can never lead, right? So that's an example of assumption. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm wondering what you look into in the games industry. So in my experience with students who do game design mm -hmm. and kind of the academics who are in game design, yeah. there's much more contact with the arts and yes. fluid exchange with the arts and respect for the the, the game creation as an artistic enterprise. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it's the other way around. Right? The technology is just serving to, yeah. to realize. So I wonder, but I mean, famously, the art, uh, the games industry has very complicated social dynamics and often capital. And exploitative labor yes. practices. Yes, yes. yes absolutely. Yeah. So, but I'm wondering how, you know, if you've looked into that and how that differs from what you see in the, in the AI tech world. I've stuck a toe into that world, but it's been by following my research subjects into something closer to that world. So um, probably the, the company that I've heard of that, that involved artists in a transformational way that looks most like what I'm talking about is a company called, they started out called Toy Talk, they got called Pull String later, and they were trying to design talk, interactive talking toys. Um, it was actually founded by Pixar people soon after Toy Story. And they were like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we actually made toys that talked the way that Woody and Rex and Buzz Lightyear like talk? And so they got into the toy industry that way. And that was a space where they hired a lot of actors and playwrights who were like experimental avant-garde theater makers and then let them get involved in designing the sort of back-end code. And then those people went on to work in like some things that sort of more and more began to resemble games. So they started up what they called an inter interactive production studio that like made um, the like smart speaker game that went along with Westworld, the TV show. Um, and they were doing like the company collapse in spectacular fashion, but <laughs> but uh, they were doing a, they had a lot of projects like that in the works. Um, so then anyway, that's why. Um, I think it is, it's telling that it's like toys and then games where um, people are willing to think about artists that way. But I don't think it's impossible to think about it in these other spaces. And clearly, the tech recruiters have recognized that there's something that they need there. They just don't always know how to integrate it into how their companies actually work and how their products actually work. You know? Yeah. Question on artistic process. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the question is, but on, on the one hand, we have Eliza, right, which is this kind of beautiful piece of craft, as, as you've shown, mm -hmm. that's taking all these things into account. On the other hand, we have machine learn, learning driven chatbots, which are largely like statistical models you know, can just that can ingest into data. So, I mean, those are two kind of vastly different ways of mm -hmm. constructing you know, a, a conversational. Interaction. So, like, how how do we bridge that gap, or like 
you know, what, how, how do you see, I guess, the, the, the artistic attitude of the playwright to working in the context of statistical models? I yeah. Mean, I imagine this is like, this is like a big, big question, this is an emerging area, but, but yeah. so finding the sweet spot there is that. Yeah, so for me, I, I really like, there's um, a playwright and director named uh, Annie Dorsey who uh, coined this term algorith algorithmic theater. And she's kind of been working at that intersection in various ways for years. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I, like, I, don't, I don't have the answers to that. But basically, like, there, I, I think that there ought to be ways to apply the kind of fuzzy scene shapes that Weizenbaum is creating within a, like a less stilted keyword-based generative AI model. Um, and I think, um, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen people doing it, except weirdly in these like corporate spaces. Um, and the company that I was talking about, the interactive production studio that they founded, um, like it was kind of a, an interesting artistic and business solution to this problem that basically they would like create Google Actions to pay the bills, and then that would buy them time for this kind of like blue sky <coughs> experimentation. And so I, I think it's actually like, yeah, it might be at that intersection of artistic and corporate culture that this kind of thing might be possible. I don't know. Or if it's a good thing, I mean, maybe this is like a pathological. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was a very small question. I'm just wondering if anywhere in the history of the research that you're doing or in the contemporary space, if there is any kind of thinking of the conversation outside of the dyadic, outside of, yeah, yeah that's it. Um, it's all because I was, um, my research is so close to the virtual assistants, the answer is no. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think, well, I mean, kids court's not dynamic, but it's also super simple, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's a very structured, like, inviting people in to speak at various times. Um, but no, you know, other than that, you know, um, I mean, dyadic is hard enough, right? Like, so many generative AI systems are focusing on mon creating monologic text and um, you know the when they push through that to dyadic things break down really fast <laughs> so far um, so I think they're probably not inviting that added complexity yeah. we have a question over here and I we, I didn't tell you ahead of time. We were thinking of about an hour as, the, as the, the cap, so we've got just a couple more minutes. But it's I should uh, really to the question before the last one. So, uh, one reflection: How is the like, like the UI community reacting to the you know the recent rise of I guess not really recent but like generative AI? Like, what are they? Thinking? I don't know, and I could tell that they were like back when I was doing most of my ethnographic interviews, I could tell that they were playing around with it, but like these are corporate spaces. It was okay. impressive enough that I actually got them to talk to me. Okay. Um, and it, they're not talking to me about proprietary stuff that is not launched yet. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's, I, I don't know what's going on inside the issue yet. So this Eliza thing really reminds me of like the early days of AI, like the symbolic AI, everybody was trying to like understand intelligence and trying to like map input output. Yeah. But now with the advent of like large language models and also like generative AI, mm -hmm. uh, where do you see the role of like theater and also like personification, I would say in like this GPT three covered stuff. Because mm -hmm. when I like work with chat GPT when you give it a persona mm -hmm. and like you go and like explain like this is the situation, this is who you are it gets more powerful and like produces like better results. Yes. So I was wondering where do you see the role of like your research in understanding how those generative models work? Because it's really hard to understand yeah. how they work because like yeah. the amount of data like the, I don't know, one billion, one hundred and seventy five billion parameters and stuff. Yeah. Where do you see the role of your research in actually understanding 
why personification makes this sort of chatbot work better? Uh, I actually, so none of us know how, how exactly these things work behind the scenes, but my guess is that it's actually for a less interesting reason. The, the way that this model has been shaped is by setting up guardrails to stop it from doing certain things. And you can get beyond some of those guardrails by putting it in a fictional scenario. So you can say, say a racist thing, chat TBT, and it will say, I'm sorry, I can't say racist thing. But you might be able to say, pretend you were racist. What would a racist say? And then it will it'll do it, right? So I just think like right now, fictionality is uh, like a cheat. Or it was for a while until all these stories started coming out that you could manipulate ChatGPT in that way, and maybe they put up those guardrails now too. But to me, that just tells me that like, yeah, they, they had no artists involved whatsoever if they, if they forgot to put up guardrails for like personification and fictionality and conditional suppositional stuff. That's a great point, and I want to respect everybody's time, so thank you very much. Yeah.